Hi, it's uh, Joe Mizumdar from Exploration Insights. I'm at the uh, September edition of the Metals Investment Forum in Vancouver, and uh, with me right now is uh, Michael Hudson. Mike? Mike is the CEO of Southern Cross Gold, which is an ASX-listed company that I visited several months ago that is now looking to dual list in the TSX. But I, I, the, the big thing that they have is a Fosterville-like asset in Victoria, in the uh, southern eastern part of Australia. So tell us what this asset is, Mike. Joe, this is a gold asset. It's a very high-grade gold asset uh, that sits um, uh, within the shadow of the head frame of Fosterville, which is the, the analog. So we came into Victoria a couple of years ago looking for another one. We understand how they form and why they form and how they get better at depth. Uh, we've got some of the best intersections globally over the last year and it's a big system, it's got a lot of room to grow. And I was down there and we did a, a you know, a bit of a discussion at the Victoria Gold Show, which, uh, which was around the same time, but we talked about how much of a unicorn the actual Fosterville deposit is. And, and finding another one like that, what kind of impact it could make to anybody. And so it's, it's worthy of drilling. And so you've drilled a lot there and your plans right now are to drill more. With, with five to six rigs. Yeah, so we listed in May 2022 on the ASX. Uh, we put 60 kilometers of drilling in. We've got five rigs operating now, another rig coming in the next month. So we've got a lot of momentum and that's one clear way to make a discovery, but you've got to be on the system and it's got to be delivering. And actually it's got to be getting better. And that's happening with us. Uh, you know, we've got 4,500 gram meter intersections or better with only that 58 kilometers of drilling. And I like to use that as a measure of you know, the hit rate versus the amount of drilling. And, and, and I haven't seen anything better in my career, actually, and, and certainly I can't see anything globally that's better at the moment. Um, so it's a very good start. Um, we've drilled, we've got uh, a 10 kilometer long trend. We've drilled uh, within one kilometer, down to a kilometer, about a third of that area. Uh, we've got an expiration target that's between one and 1.6 million ounces at between seven and 10 grams gold equivalent with the antimony giving 20%. And that's only, that was back in January. So we're heading towards our aim with 60 kilometers is to get to build that out to 3 million ounces at 10 grams, which gives a very special, very special deposit. And within that is still, you're talking about what, 1.3 kilometers of strike in a system that's- 10 uh, to 12 kilometers long. So that's only 10% what I just talked about. It's the runway for the next year. And of course, these systems, go down further than where we've drilled them. And if you look at the surrounding mines being Fosterville or Costaville, it could be up to two kilometers. And so it's only talking half that. So it's a very small part of a larger system and you always want room to grow, of course. And what I was impressed with when I went there is that one, I mean, these high grade deposits can be highly variable, but the variability of the gold mineralization doesn't seem to be so high. And, 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 and the predictability seems mm. to be very good. And I was also impressed by the people that you had working the asset, uh, and especially by the young man who's worked a lot of them and uh, structurally has a good idea of where the gold has formed. Yeah, no, so that's very true. So uh, Victoria is known for its nuggety gold, actually, the Bendigo and Ballarats of the world. They're a very different orogenic event. So they formed 70 million years earlier than this new class that we're just starting to understand, which is Fosterville, which is Sunday Creek, which is Costafield. And this class of deposits up here form amazingly high grades and they get better at depth. And we know geologically why that's the case now. And that's only seven or eight years old, that understanding. And yeah. the understanding leads to uh, how you go and explore for it and how you find more. But the other way, the other aspect is, is how you put them together in a resource. And we're running an internal resource for understanding. And it's really been driven by Kenny Bush, who, who was in the think tank of you know, uh, seven or eight people who Fosterville had for many years trying to understand what they had and why it was there and if they could find another one. So we're really uh, standing on the shoulders of giants in terms of that knowledge and it's benefit, benefited us hugely. Yeah. So uh, going forward, I mean, you, you, you're planning on listing on the TSX. And so I guess my question is why? Are you planning on listing on the uh, on the on the Toronto Stock Exchange when, I guess even at Beaver Creek it seemed like the ASX names were getting more support than the TSX name. So you're going almost counter current. Right? Mm, yeah, and no, that's not always necessarily best to be first mover in life. But <laughs> uh, we 
we have 50% of our ownership essentially here already in Canada because 48% to be precise, 48.7% is owned by Mawson Gold, a TSXV listed company that we spun the assets out of oh, a couple of years ago. So that was that's where, and those that stock has been escrowed for the last two years. So it came out of escrow in May this year. So we wanted to consolidate the ownership rather than having it essentially split between two uh, exchanges. So we're bringing the companies together. It will be the first time it's consolidated ownership of that asset. So that's one thing that will unlock a quite a funky structure that um, is through history, but we're unraveling it and simplifying it and a lot more institutional money at least will be able to buy it. Uh, and then we're dual listing because of the split of shareholders, but also we're dual listing here because it's the home of high grade gold. Um, there was $10 billion market cap appreciation made from yep. Crocodile Gold right through to Agnico. Uh, the Canadian market gets that. We've got some of the best investors in the Canadian market. Pierre Lassonde is one of our larger shareholders amongst many other high profile people in, in this market that the Australian market less appreciates. So we have a, an Australian story that has worked well in Canada before. Right. And I've had 25 years in this market. So despite the accent, I, I, this is my home. I know Toronto better than I do Melbourne or Sydney. So, so we're not newbies to this space. And, and the strange thing for me is that uh, I'm, I've met you in Finland. Uh, you've got a project in Peru that I visited and you've been around the world uh, raising money for different projects globally. And then suddenly the project that uh, could be the unicorn is only like, what is it, an hour from your house right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it even gets worse than that. I grew up in the town next to this discovery um, and, and st was in a little school of seven kids. I'm a country boy overlooking this project. So you can either look at that as a nice story or, or I'm slow. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do both. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's talk, uh, I mean, for people looking at this that might not know Southern Cross Gold because it's ASX listed, but understand the Fosterville model because they may have made money from it. What, what's coming up for, uh, besides the, uh, the, the merger transaction, which I think is booked for November, what else is coming up? Yeah, so that transaction will finish mid to late November. We've got five rigs going to six. So we're very serious about that growth story of uh, building this out to three and a half million ounces over the next year. So that's, that value proposition is unique in itself. So that's, that's how our shareholders will make money via growth through discovery, basically. But that being said, we're not just uh, uh, bulls in a china shop being geologists just trying to drill uh, without context. So we're doing a lot of things behind the scenes in terms of that internal resource mining studies, done quite a bit of met and we've got more to do. Uh, we've got all the environmental baseline work underway. We've got a development team that's looking to build or design the project that we can permit. And we're doing a lot of work politically, both uh, from the, the municipal, state and federal level. We're going through voluntary negotiations with the Aboriginal group, Tungurung, who uh, have the native title rights. So we'll be ready with them, ideally, when we're ready to start the permitting process. Um, they'll be standing beside us. So there's many things we're doing around discovery that you'd expect uh, well-trained technical people to be doing. But in terms of share price appreciation, um, you'll see it come through drilling and we're, we're very, very focused uh, about that uh, per share valuation metric as opposed to just creating a larger market cap company and, um, and our shareholder base um, that I've already mentioned some of the people involved are uh, uber focused on that as well. So sometimes, like when I was in Victoria, they talked about permitting in Victoria. Uh, and, and so uh, recently, I mean, uh, there is a record of, of projects, mining projects actually getting permitted in Victoria. So recently, I, I think we were just talking before, uh, the Mandalay just got permitted for expansion of its tailings pond. That's right. So we've got five mines operating in Victoria today. We're producing more gold than we have for 100 years. And that's a large reflection on mm -hmm. the Fosterville mm -hmm. discovery, of course. But there's five four other mines other than Fosterville. There's been some new fast track legislation called the Development Facilitation Program that worked very well in the quarrying industry over the last year or so, which brought $8 billion more, $8 billion more rock to market. Now that, uh, that legislation is being applied to mining projects, including the Mandalay project that permitted a third tailings dam 
within five months because of that legislation. So that's slightly, you know, everyone uh, draws back when they hear that because it's quite a, a very fast track time frame, especially in Victoria. That's uh, it's been a developed place, and you've got to have a project that you can you can build in that state, and it's and it hasn't always been as fast as Western Australia. The area where we are is uh, in old farming land, and it's it's very limited. There's only 12 properties to the north of the prop, uh, project within two kilometres and there's no one literally for 10 kilometres to the south. So it's just a unique little area too, which makes it quite special. So let's end this with uh, with the, I guess, the sweetener, the antimony. So what has happened in the antimony market recently that, I mean, it might not, I'm not sure how much of an impact it could have on the net present value of the project, but potentially on reducing the capital cost, cost of capital of of funding this project was was the antimony credit uh, mm. for this project. Uh, so how do you how do you see the antimony? Antimony, as we say, <laughs> antimony, as you say, uh, is let's is, call the whole thing off. <laughs> is uh, the most critical metal you've never heard of is what we used to say up until a few uh, months or so ago. And the Chinese, of course, have just put export restrictions that came in on se September the fifteenth. It's used in the fire retardant to the industry and 17% goes into clarification of solar cells. But the main criticality is around defence and it's used as a primer in every munition. So the 82% of the world's antimony comes through China and Russia and, and the West has lost its supply chain. Uh, what we have will be one of the larger antimony projects in the Western world. We're in the US system now and, um, and we're having those discussions around uh, potentially, potentially, um, uh, partnering with the uh, with the US DOD and 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 that uh, we've seen at least in peers in the US has brought a lot of grants and funding to lower that cost of capital that you're referring to. This project was actually ironically kept open during World War One by the Imperial Munitions Act. So it was the English <laughs> that uh, dominated in those days mm -hmm. during World War One, and now we're talking to the Americans. So it's been a critical metals project for a long time and, and for the very same reasons that it is now. But it's a it's about 20% in situ recoverable value. So it is a meaningful part of the project. And, um, and in the metallurgical flow sheet, we'll have a gravity float and we'll have a sorry, gravity con and a, a, copper, a gold antimony float. So uh, it, it, it is very part of the, much of the product mix. All right, well, that's it. Southern Cross Gold, Mike Hudson, CEO, plenty of catalysts, 60,000 meters planned with five to six rigs uh, in a Fosterville-like deposit uh, project in uh, Victoria, New South Wales, oh, sorry, Victoria, Southeastern Australia. Thank you very much. It's Joe Mazumdar, Exploration Insights at the Mills Investment Forum uh, at the September edition. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for listening.